Hey folks, this is Nathan Long, president of Saybrook University and host of our podcast, Saybrook Insights. It is really good to be back here in studio recording uh, our podcast today. Um, wow, I just got back from Portland, Oregon. What a journey that was. I was caught up in the midst of all the flying and airline tomfoolery that was going on, had some interesting conversations with people from all over this great country of ours. One gentleman who had already been canceled five times. Lots of questions around what's going on with business, with how we're treating the employees, the pilots, the the flight crews, the staff that are you know, working day in and day out to get us from where we need to go. And I was just thinking on my way to the office the other day as uh, I was coming out of Portland and we had all this trouble and trauma, I think, for many travelers and indeed for the airline staffers, um, you know, just how important it is to treat our people well, how important it is that business is at the center of how we represent and who we are. Uh, in society because business is us, right? Then I stop at the local gas station and I'm uh, paying $7 a gallon for gas. Uh, we saw the weekly grocery bill go up nearly double from what it was just a month ago. My son and I started talking about that uh, as well as, uh, you know, as reflecting on the fact that, man, this is getting tough, right? Uh, and when you think about the challenges around not just groceries and gas, but interest rates going up and how difficult difficult it is to just get by for our working class and middle class families, guess what's at the center of that? Business, our economy. And it's true these challenges have an outsized impact on working class and impoverished Americans, not to mention those across the globe. And then we have this whole issue of sustainability and climate change that is no doubt impacting how we live and uh, in some cases where we live. And that will be the case more and more as we move into the future. Again, it strikes me that at the center of all of this storm is business. Today's guest, Dr. Mary Kay Chess, our chair of the Department of Business Administration, is someone I am thrilled to be talking with about these challenges and about how business is at the center of these storms and what it means and how, how we can leverage the power of businesses to drive positive social change for the social good. How do businesses make change in a way that, yeah, it should be profitable? But can it be person-centered? Can it care? Can businesses care about the planet? And can they still remain focused on that day-to-day -day purpose? The conversation uh, I'm having today with Mary Kay really centers in and homes in really on those topics and a host of others uh, related to our MBA and DBA programs. But I think what really strikes a chord for me is how Mary Kay represents as someone from the business world who says that we really are in journey together and that in order to make change, we need to hold one another closely and understand our common humanity. And that's something the humanistic ethos at Saybrook really uh, embodies, I think, or is embodied by Saybrook uh, in our day-to-day -day mission and lived experience. So, Join me today. I'm glad you're joining me uh, on this journey and join me today on this episode featuring Dr. Mary Kay Chess, our department chair of the Business Administration Program. All right. Mary Kay Chess, Dr. Mary Kay Chess, what a joy to have you here today on Saybrook Insights as our department chair. Uh, the department chair for the MBA and DBA programs, as well as our PhD managing organizational systems for a short time, maybe for a little bit. Um, before we get started, why don't you tell us about yourself, your personal history, you know, as it uh, relates to business and organizational leadership. Let's learn about the Mary Kay. 
Well, first of all, Dr. Long, thank you so much for setting this up and giving us a chance to talk about a topic that's near and dear, uh, and that is um, how do we support the leaders that will be helping us move forward in this world of unexpected changes. So as I think about my background and what I um, had the privilege of having throughout my experiences in healthcare. I come out as a healthcare executive, Nathan, uh, working in hospitals, clinics in both urban and rural areas, having the privilege of working with very diverse groups of clinicians with very, very different ideas of what healthcare meant and what healthcare means. And when you unite that with a patient and community experience, it really enmeshed me in this whole world of diversity stakeholders. So that was really my launch into what can we learn about um, having conversations that matter, having differences that take us to innovation, not just um, uh, perhaps bad feelings, but really take us to leadership in new ways. And so that whole experience in healthcare, I just think, um, coupled with my uh, opportunity to teach, really solidified um, the opportunities for leadership in new and different ways. And who knew? We were going to have a health crisis. Multiple health crises, right? I mean, multiple on that level. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So you said you were in the healthcare side of the business world. What does that mean for our lay audience out there? When you say you were on the business side and you did business or uh, a leadership in those areas, what, what did that look like on a day-to-day -day level for you? Oh, what a great question. So I'm going to parse it into two kind of sides of a coin, for perhaps. So on one side of the coin, I certainly was responsible with a team of amazing people always to create budgets that were responsive, uh, capital budgets, operating budgets, had to know that, had to understand that, had to make friends with the CFO of any organization I worked with. They were just a key part of the team. Uh, and being responsive with reports, being um, thoughtful about expenditures, and being very thoughtful about as new opportunities came, how could we creatively and thoughtfully and responsibly move dollars perhaps for um, a different patient experience. The other side of the coin, Nathan, was how you connected with these very diverse stakeholders. So it's both the hard science, it's often called the hard and the soft science. I would say reversing it. Sometimes the conversations were harder than creating a budget, <laughs> uh, but um, equally rewarding. So obviously there had to be some hard decisions your team had to make, right? I mean, healthcare is, you know, continuously, I, I mean, I don't mean to indict a whole uh, side of the, the field, but it's very reactive, having worked in it myself a little bit. Yeah. How did you manage that sea change, that constant sea change of, you know, you're up in revenue, you got to change some things and how you're doing business, probably layoffs are part of the equation at some point. How, do you, how did you do that? How did you manage that as a leader uh, in a way that was, I mean, you're always very compassionate. The person I know, you're compassionate. You also know that tough decisions have to be made in a business climate. How did you balance all that? Oh, that was, um, I'll give you an example from, um, that really involves technology and technology is very, conversations about technology and, and artificial intelligence are very much a part of our MBA and DBA conversations as well now. But um, it, part of the responsibility was to thoughtfully engage staff in what are the impact, what are the opportunities and impact of technology. And so, for example, one of the initiatives that we had to do with an institution I work with was automating the accounts payable. Mm. And so in automation comes both the advantage of new skills, but also the unfortunate um, uh, situation of layoffs. And so one of the early learnings and the mentoring that I was fortunate enough to give from a consulting partner was uh, communication early, often and as transparently as you're able to do with the business needs in front of you. And then people have a choice. Would they like to learn a new approach? Would they like to get a new position? Balancing the, the mandate of the business and the concern and giving employees a choice uh, was the, the coin again. 
giving them a choice in how they're responding and reacting to uh, the changes and the uh, new opportunities that emerge. It's very well stated. So you came from that side of the world, the business side, into the academic side, which at times it's becoming more of a, a bit, well, you know, for many of us in it already, it's a business, right? Mm -hmm. um, what led you into the academic side of business, right? And in business leadership, organizational change, management, et cetera. I hadn't thought about that. So thank you, Nathan, for that. Um, on a personal note, I'll just insert that here. Um, and it's also one of the um, attributes we look for when we're interviewing candidates for the MBA and the DBA, as well as the PhD in systems thinking, um, is what is your curiosity? What is your commitment to learning? And it's not just learning while you get an MBA or learning while you get a DBA. It's that lifelong commitment. How willing are you to create networks of mentors? How willing are you to um, be curious about what someone in a totally different discipline has to say? That's what attracted me to the business side. How can I continually take what I learn from theory into the business uh, world, apply it, come back and pivot, many times fail. And Nathan, it's really part of the learning to encourage failure early and often. How wonderful to do that in an academic setting where there's consultants all around you. Right. That is an incredible bonus that then you take back to the business world and there's certainly failures are possible there, but you've had this kind of trial run. So I think that was part of um, what brought me the lifelong learning and the chance to experiment, pivot, and pilot. Oh, experiment, pivot, and pilot. Yes. There you go for our audience. Those are three <laughs> quick takeaways from the beginning. So, okay, that's very cool. You've had a an interesting journey on the academic train, if you will, um, and you've landed at Saybrook University. How did you find your way to us? What made it stand out uh, for you? I will tell you, I'd, I'd like to, to uh, honor my colleague, Dr. Don Moss, at this point. When I was working in healthcare, um, I got connected with um, Dr. Moss, who leads our Mind Body Medicine College. And um, uh, I uh, was recruited to teach a course in leadership. And Don has this amazing um, gift of saying yes. You know, often in business, it's like, oh, no, we might not have the budget or, oh, no, this takes away from another initiative. Those things don't cross um, his Dr. Moss's mind in most cases. And so when I said, could I put a course together for you on systems and could I enhance leadership in this way, his response was always yes. And I thought, what a cool school. Uh, what a what a wonderful culture because we teach in organizations that there has to be that cultural fit. And I thought, well, this is pretty invitational. This is pretty generative. This is what we want to export into business, it, particularly in healthcare. How do we say yes? So um, both his his way of inviting the culture of Saybrook, that was my entry point. Some, gosh, 14 years ago now, I think, 13 or 14. That is so interesting. I did not realize he was your personal portal of entry <laughs> into the university. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah. And I still get to work with him. On a day-in, day-out basis, right? Yeah. yeah, that's pretty yeah. fabulous. Okay, so we have Don Moss to thank for you being here. That's awesome. That's yeah. terrific. And you've been re really responsible for lots of development of the previous organizational systems work, some of the, the courses, the mentoring of students, but also uh, the MBA program, the DBA. We'll get into a little bit about those in just a bit. I have some more probing questions, though, for you. All right. Some more philosophical stuff. And then we'll get into the meat and potatoes, if you will, the Midwestern potatoes of uh, <laughs> the MBA DBA program. So I was thinking about this the other day as I was um, coming back from Portland, Oregon. You know, it, it, the news just keeps getting worse, Mary Kay. Yeah. It is depression in a bottle, right? I mean, it's just constant. And um, it, it just seems like in today's business climate, our, our uh, economics, um, you know, 
the education of business leaders and managers, we had some wicked, interesting, and uh, uh, unique opportunities, of course, uh, coupled with those challenges. And we're seeing right now, right, the economy is what one politician uh, recently described as stuck in a ditch. Uh, inflation's at 8.5% over the last year. Gas is at it's all one of its all-time highs. I heard in today's dollars, it's still less than when it was really high, but it's getting close. And then we've got so many challenges where climate change is concerned and the need for sustainability. It's so vital, vital to ensure that future for generations to come. I guess I was thinking, like, clearly, business lies at the center of all of this. That It just does. I mean, whether it's a business of healthcare or the entrepreneur or, you know, the big sustainability uh, juggernauts out there or the car manufacturers, Tesla, whomever. Talk a little bit about your own perceptions of where we're at today and then maybe lead in a bit about how can a business degree um, prime people to be ready for all this topsy-turvy change that's going on. I, I think your your question um, really allows a very thoughtful reflection on how one maintains joy, maintains a commitment to other human colleagues, and how we hold a hand out to one another with all of those challenges you just identified, Nathan, as well as a war in Ukraine yep. and, um, uh, you know, still the remnants of a, a several pandemics, healthcare pandemics. Um, and so I think that um, the I'm going to bring in one of the historic foundations of Saybrook at this point, and it's our humanistic foundation. It starts with me, the person, but then it also quickly goes to you and I talking, and then the conversation that we have in larger faculty and student bodies. How do we thoughtfully talk about these challenges in a way that um, allows us to feel the pain of ourselves and others and then say, and then what? How can we, as I, the poet uh, on an island just north of where I live, um, uh, Whidbey Island, uh, David White says, how can we have beautiful conversations in the middle of distress? And so that takes us then right to our human way of accounting for um, what's going on, but it then takes us right to business. And the business that we, that we teach, and there are many models, so I don't want to say one is better than the other, but the one that we have found, Nathan, that really um, tends to invigorate, um, give hope, um, allow us to serve seven generations as, you, as you've talked about, and this can change, but what we have really learned is that adaptive leadership, that model of adaptive leadership, when there are many right answers, not one, but many right answers, takes us to business propositions that allow that experimentation, that pivoting, that piloting that's so essential. And that'll be a theme probably that, you know, I share with you as we continue this conversation. So it's self-care, recognition that self does need care for, that we do that in the company of others and not just like-minded others, but we pull together as many different voices as we can. And then we apply the business tenets of, you know, what does it mean to have an economy that works for all? What does it mean to have an approach to um, accounting that takes into account a bottom line where some 80 or so percent are actually the people of an organization? How do we take that into account? Um, so that's where I see, again, perhaps the image of a coin, um, people and process, people and business processes um, coupled together. Quite a lovely response, and I give you a lot to respond to. So I, you get an A plus on that, Doctor Chess. Oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah, you know, it strikes me too that you know, sort of building off of that r response, your response. You know, we're we're also in a an economic system. You know, was was it Winston Churchill that said capitalism? It's the worst of all the, or it's the best of all the worst systems, right? So, and business thrives as a capitalist. Uh, in a capitalist system, 
of course. And yet you just said something that I, I found important around building an economy that works for all. And how do you do that in a capitalist economic system? How does, especially given our focus and your your approach to teaching and modeling business, how does one do that? Because capitalism is about, well, ostensibly winners and losers, right? Absolutely. And I think we have to start with that, Nathan. So we start with the reality. We start with what has been a common way of looking at, you know, I'm going to call them, um, you know, way of living, a way of thriving. And that's, you know, some get more and some get even less of the less. And so then the, it becomes that wonderful, innovative, adaptive challenge. What's another way? What's perhaps a better way? And can we do this change by asking one another the those beautiful questions that David White talks about and really hear one another? You know, we talk about um, uh, opportunities like the circular economy where you're putting back what you're extracting. Yep. That's a very simplistic way of, of reckoning a different way of looking at economics. But um, how do we have the patience to say there is another way? And how do we invest the time and the patience to both hear and to experiment with those other ways? And we do know it's possible. And so our work, I think, as educators is to support that innovation, to support those questions while they may be very painful, and to really ignite this spirit of it. we can change things. Yeah. We can change things and still survive. And in fact, that's what we have to do. Mm -hmm. That's our imperative. You're our Pied Piper, Mary Kay. Wow. <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm fortunate. I'll just pause here and say that I have amazing colleagues. The students that we um, are, frankly, so privileged to work with are doing work in so many different fields. And really, our, uh, our alums become then the support team to say, you can do this. It is possible. So um, uh, it happens in community. So let's let's rest in that for a minute and talk about what what is happening with your faculty and with the students. Where, what are your faculty doing? What have they been doing in the world of business? And what about your students who are you know? I think we have a couple of alumni now that are are really out there doing some good things. Yeah, maybe tell us about their profiles just briefly. I'd love to hear more about them. You know, I'll I'll give you just kind of two ends of the continuum. Um, one of our um, now uh, alums is actually um, uh, being considered for uh, the the executive position in a mental health enterprise. And can you think of anything better than you know one of the demands right now? We know from the healthcare pandemics is that mental health has really taken a body blow. Yep. And so here she is with all now of the basic tools um, that come in business. You know, how do you how do you create a budget? Um, how do you deploy that budget? How do you work effectively in teams across a country and across the globe? And so she is doing that work with the um, mentorship behind her of colleagues that she has built relationships with, of faculty she's built relationships with. So as she needs those, those are resources for her. So that's on one end of our student continuum. On the other end is this incredibly courageous um, MBA graduate who's working in IT. Um, and we think, oh, IT is just the tool that supports um, conversations like this. Right. But it's so much more. And so he's been able to talk about what are the human implications for engagement? What does it mean to be in front of a screen like this uh, for long periods of time? And so in addition to the analytics and the hard economic factors that go into building IT systems, he's also been able to import what is the human aspect of this. And so those are just two examples of our students and what they're engaged in. I should say alums um, at this point. Faculty um, bring, I've just been really, really privileged to pull together faculty that represent, um, uh, I'll talk about Dr. Marsha Willard, for example. She was the founder of the International Sustainability 
uh, Professionals Association, and so we are now building a partnership with them um, that's allowing us to work globally um, with uh, short bursts of what does it mean for sustainability as we move forward, because the rubrics of sustainability have changed. The climate footprint has changed. Um, we know we have goals for for um, uh, the year of 35, but how do we get there? Um, and then I think of my uh, colleague, Dr. Johnson, who is leading some of our DBA um, uh, initiatives and will be teaching this fall. And she brings together this world of not only acknowledging um, diversity, but Nathan of saying, how do we in our dissertation work? How do we in our classes take the, the theoretical aspects of diversity and inclusion and make them go live? What does that mean? So she's been able to work with our students in a fantastic way to make that happen. And that's just two, two profiles. And, you know, I could go through some other ones, but those are just kind of show you the wealth and the richness of faculty meetings. Yeah, that's fabulous. Yeah. And, and for those listening, you can see their profiles on the saybrook.edu website. And there, there are some, I'm using this term a lot lately, wickedly awesome faculty that you've brought on board uh, to help lead uh, the MBA DBA initiative. So uh, truly great profiles you, you've mentioned. You did lean into a bit on the sustainability front and you and I have talked offline about several other topics. Sustainability is, is all the rage uh, right now. And yet I, I have to wonder, is it really, is any, is anyone accomplishing anything with it? And I, I've seen a lot of action or a lot of talk, but not a lot of real viable action. Now, it, it, there's a gentleman here in town, uh, Terry Tamanen, who's leading the effort with the Port of L.A. Uh, and doing some very interesting things and actually had a lot of important wisdom around the, the viability and, and, and driving of MBA programs with sustainability focus uh, or at least sustainably oriented uh, degree programs and uh, like minded types of training. Talk a little bit in your mind, and, and I think, you know, for, for some of in our audience, sustainability is a big umbrella of stuff that we can't always wrap our head around. And so it might be helpful before we get into the, the nuts and bolts of the MBA, DBA programs, what is sustainability to you and to, to Saybrook's program? Like, what does it mean? And what are some of the goals, objectives of the program that help our students uh, accomplish some of the, the the wicked issues that are out there already. Well, I think Nathan, you captured it when you talked about the umbrella, um, and um, uh, is sustainability really does. Uh, when I think about the UN goals on sustainability, it's everything from um, is there a, a sound water supply, just drinking that that I take for granted every day to um, the um, ability to grow um, food that will supply a, a geographic area. And so that umbrella is probably, it is a vast umbrella. And so what, what the program and what those of us who are involved in thinking about sustainability opportunities and certainly challenges it's almost as though we have to see it through something that Saybrook has had for, gosh, I think Nathan, and correct me, some 50 years, it's that basis of systems thinking. Mm -hmm. So even though, uh, because in systems thinking, we know that there are connections, we may not be able to see them totally, we may not be able to see them clearly, but we know from systems thinking that everything, in fact, is connected. So the work of the gentleman in the port is so important. We know supply chain and how we source things is critical. So his work is a part of the system that brings um, uh, purchasing power and decision making, that individual choice. So the individual is there as well as the the um, the whole where are we sourcing, how are we sourcing, um, what are the values of those involved in that. So. The invitation for ourselves individually is under this big umbrella, perhaps what one challenge am I willing to take on? Okay. And it doesn't mean that it won't impact everyone else because it will. We know that. So it is 
it is making a difference. And um, I think about um, how long change takes. And I think about Rachel Carson's first book, um, what, some 50 years ago now. Um, and change really, if we're all out there pivoting and piloting, it really will take time. But we are beginning to build that understanding that I th that uh, I'm just going to hold and joy, Nathan, is going to make a difference. Awesome. awesome. I'm just going to hold that. You're just going to hold <laughs> it. Yep. No, I hear you. I hear you. All right. Well, we'll get into to bits of that in in, in a moment as well, because I want to explore kind of the the tenets of sustainability and also how the MBA responds to climate change in general, like how, or maybe more specifically. Um, but let's talk about the MBA DBA programs at Saybrook. But maybe that's what a lot of our listeners are tuning in for. Um, but what can a new student uh, do with these degrees? What should a new student coming into the program expect to experience in terms of the courses, the faculty, time requirements, et cetera? Like just at a broad level, what, what, what does that all mean? I'm going to think of the gentleman that we've had the privilege of interviewing as a possible MBA student um, today. Uh, and um, why he was interested and um, what he brings to the table and what he's expecting of us. So let me respond to that. His, he was intrigued by the fact that his time represents money. It represents uh, an opportunity to do something different, but to make a choice about how long he's doing that. And so um, the MBA, it is possible in, this, in the MBA program with 30 credits. That may be more technical than you want to get, but I think it's important to know. 30 credits, one year, and he's making, he's stepping back and looking at that, that return on investment for himself and his family and his community and saying, that's an investment I can make. That's doable. And so that's kind of the first part of the conversation. The second part of the conversation is, um, how will this be different than other schools? Mm -hmm. And what a great question that is. Yeah. And so part of the response, and um, Dr. Willard and I both interviewed this um, potential student. So Dr. Willard was able to say, how versed are you in um, profiles of sustainability on water, on carbon, on economics? Um, and you could tell that this um, particular individual had spent some time thinking about those things before coming. And one of the reasons he came uh, was because it's an MBA plus. Uh, and so he was able to respond to that. And then I was able to ask him, how do you engage in difficult conversations where you are right now? Because he's actually in our field, Nathan, in higher ed. Um, and he said, that's what I want to understand. That's what I want to know that I can leave a program with the basics in, in mind that anyone would pull from a, an MBA program. And I want to know how to make those go live in the world. And I think that's the value add. So in the courses, in the courses that are taught, there are often, of course, theories. But then there are conversations. So what's this mean to you? What's changing in your blind spots? What's engaging you to think in radically different ways? Because if we continue the same way we've been doing things, we're making no progress. Yeah. What a great opportunity. Yeah. Well, I hope he says yes, and I hope we all say yes, too. <laughs> it's been a yes, yes this afternoon. We've unleashed him on our admissions team. Oh, fabulous. All right. Well, if he's out there and he knows who he is, congratulations. That's fabulous. So, you mentioned, I, I like how you position that with uh, having that student as, as sort of the lead in. You know, so many students are coming to us with families. Obviously, the MBA student is a different profile, right? Most of them are already in full-time jobs, usually in leadership positions or other types of high responsibility type roles. While this is definitely a great opportunity, how do you work with students? How do your faculty work with students to achieve balance in what will be a very intensive program? Yes, it's fabulous. You can get done in a year, maybe 18 months, depending on how you uh, take your credits. Um, but there's also that prioritization and that time you got to put into the schoolwork. So what what thoughts do you have around that? You know, I think all of our faculty and, and I have to, I will tell you that um, hopefully I set a good example. It's the life work balance. 
Uh, it is the, you are still, although you're part of uh, an academic program, your community still needs you, your family still needs you. So that element of communication that we talk about, we talk about communication from orientation all throughout the program, whether it's 12 months in the MBA or 18 months. Are you bringing your uh, family members along in the conversation because we don't most of us don't live in isolation are you talking about these concepts in your community so in that way uh, that whole um, ability to experiment mm -hmm. we really encourage people to take that um, take everyone along on the journey when we see people walk across the stage at graduation virtually or in person it is the whole family it's the whole community that's walking and some of those are babies some of those are grandmothers but it is the whole system to to bring that term back in that's walking across that stage that's been involved in the journey so I, I hope that gives it. And there are very, um, we set up mentoring with one another because often students can tell each other something that they can't tell a faculty member. And our faculty really make the business hours work for students. Uh, sometimes a student just needs 15 minutes. Um, and so um, those are also available. And the class time itself are conversations, starting with another principle that Saybrook has in most of our classes of um, let's come in and hold silence for just a moment. Allow your whole self to come into this space. Mm -hmm. So um, we call them mindful moments um, over in Dr. Moss's shop. We call them reflective pauses uh, in our business and in our DBA programs. Uh, so that allows the whole person to become present. I love it. Wow. And I like how you framed really that uh, achieving balance is all about bringing the system with you. Um, because you're part of that and they're part of you. And how fun to create those ripples. Yeah. Those yeah. matter. Oh, they absolutely do. I I think it takes me back to when my dad, he was um, the first generation college grad in our family. And it's so right. He, he, for a long time, you know, he didn't share with us all the things that he was doing. And we got into this master's program. He was... He, he brought us along for the ride with him. And it made such a difference in terms of seeing him go through that, writing his thesis, engaging with faculty members. He'd take us to the campus in Chicago. Um, and that was inspirational, right? And so think, you know, to your point too, this, when you're, that ripple effect impacts everybody in the family in not just the immediate, but also the long-term, the role modeling it does for children, for spouses, and the whole nine yards, yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, we, we're really spreading the word that change is possible. Yes. It takes time. And let's bring the, all the best ideas. We'll never have the best, but maybe let's bring all the best ideas. And who better sometimes than the grandmother? That's right. Or the five-year-old. That's right. That's right. Yeah, bring them along the ride for that capstone or thesis. That's right. <laughs> yep. So it sounds like you've got a really strong community of support. And I think, you know, we, we don't like to assume struggle, but I think to your point, you know, there will be struggles in anything that we do in life. What happens when a student begins to struggle during the program, or if they do, how, how do you all support them? What, what are the, the networks? And you, you alluded to some of these here just a minute ago. But. Yeah, I'm going to take us to the DBA for a moment because that's a longer journey. Um, that that's a journey of 54 credits and you know again depending on your background 54 or less um, but it's a three and a half to, to four and a half year commitment and so um, my experience in that program is that's a long haul that is incredible dedication um, and in the DBA program we talk about being a practitioner scholar so um, as you're taking courses both in your discipline, in economics, um, in uh, global organizational behavior, you're also taking research courses. And usually my, in my experience, when students hit the third semester, they also encounter what we call the DBA wall or the PhD wall. And it can either be a friend or it can, it can re really cause you to go, what am I doing? 
where am I going? Um, and you can just see it on faces in class. And that's why the Zoom sessions are, and we, Saybrook has a long history of teaching um, online, so it's not anything new to us, but watching faces. So usually by the third semester, we're well prepared to anticipate and expect that there will be a meeting of the wall. And so often, you know, I'll use my own class. I'm teaching right now a class in consulting uh, for the DBA students. We actually pause in the, in the session itself to do that, not just the, the initial reflection, but to talk about, let's pause here and let's talk about the rest of the journey. Let's set context. Let's talk about your dissertation question. What, what's working you, as Angelus Arian um, would say, as a good organizational developer? And so we pause for those conversations and then buffet them by, again, really encouraging these mentoring. The other thing we encourage, and this comes from another student, so I can't take credit for it, 50 cups of tea. Have you, or coffee? depending on your um, uh, depending on your preference. So have you used your first three semesters here to have coffee or tea virtually with professors from other disciplines, mm -hmm. from uh, other students? How are you building this amazing virtual Rolodex of contacts, connections, and good ideas so you're supported by an even larger community? Not to give students more work, but those connections matter. They rejuvenate, they refuel, they give courage. And then we start to bring in, and we're getting ready to do this for our, our residential conference that's coming up. We're going to bring in those students who have finished their dissertations. And so they see what's possible. They see hope. Uh, they get the, the oh my god. <laughs> but the wall then starts to come down possibility um, blooms and however people get over the wall some with grace some not it doesn't matter um, they're supported on that journey yeah I think I, I, I think I know more people who might it might have been not as graceful probably sure. myself was in that in that grouping yeah right <laughs> oh yeah but I made it out maybe a little a uh, little uh, sweaty for the wear but you know it's all good yeah no I appreciate that I've never heard it quite put that way the third semester phd or dba wall that's that's very very well stated and i love so just to put a fine point on this the idea of reaching out 50 cups of tea you said right or or coffee 50 cups of tea or coffee your choice yeah and really making those connections across the university of your network and really using that as your point of inspiration. Well, and there's a there's a practical notion to that from a business perspective. You're starting to figure out who you'd like on your dissertation committee. Yeah, yeah. And they know you so strategically, which is something we also teach in the DBA and the MBA. Strategically, you're starting to align with what you need to um, finish your dissertation. So there's a practical call to it as well. Yeah, yeah, no, I love that. That's, that's fabulous. So... You know, I think we've had several golden tips today just in this uh, first half hour or so we've been on. So on the MBA, DBA side of things, you know, um, again, we've it, typically the MBA students a different profile in terms of those who come to us. However, I know we've got folks who are maybe not working full time, are coming back for sec, you know, a second career, upskilling as we call it in, in certain aspects of higher ed. Um, you know, what about post-degree? Do I get a job right away if I'm a graduate? Are there internships, practicums required as part of this? What are some of the things that I need to do to make sure? And that 50 cups of tea, that's a, a fabulous starter point right there. But yeah, any thoughts on it? I think I'm going to take us back to the relationship between faculty and students. One of the value um, adds of our Saybrook programs, both MBA, DBA, and PhD, is that the cohorts, the learning communities are small. So that means we get to learn about each other's dreams. When people introduce themselves, we have them introduce themselves with the front part of the business card and the, and the back side of the business card. So what is it that you want to do in the world and what are your values and purpose? 
because we know that fit, cultural fit, and um, aligned purpose really make a difference. So in a way, we start during orientation as people introduce themselves as faculty to begin to go, ah, this person's going to need an internship here, or they're looking for work here. And I have to tell you, our student services are really, I, I just got off a call um, that, you know, you were there as well, um, Dr. Long, where the services that are being offered by, by our student services division are just so, in, they enhance our ability as faculty. The handshake program, the program that actually financially supports students joining organizations like ISSP. Then we encourage them, so when are you going to give a presentation and test your ideas among your colleagues? When are you going to go and make use of a network site that exposes you to, you know, cups of coffee numbers 7 through 14. And so part of also class assignments at times include you have to, you have the opportunity to go and listen to the World Resource Institute. You get to go listen to that because we want you to connect with them and understand that there are jobs in that field that you may not have thought about. Um, it's a, always an area that needs improvement, needs strength, but I think we have a good foundation underneath us in partnership with our colleagues across the university. Um, and again, it starts in day one. And part of why, part of my selection of faculty is, are you faculty that share the wealth? Mm. Um, and that means, are you willing to go the extra mile with students and say, I'll be a reference for you? Or I've got a colleague in this institution that I think you need to do an internship with. And so we're fortunate to be surrounded by that um, amazing generosity. Oh, that's that's wonderful. So, you know, just to, to highlight and, re, uh, you know, accentuate the point that you raised with our student affairs team. So, you know, fun fact for those out there, Saybrook is a largely fully virtual university for the most part. We have our residential conferences uh, for certain programs, but we have one of the uh, a, a growing student affairs team. So we'll be one of the first fully virtual with a robust student affairs department, has student groups, has all the things that you might find at a bricks and mortar institution and on the career side has been building out a career services platform that ties into this. So if you are newer to you know the world of work, you're coming out of bachelor's pursuing your MBA, there are opportunities there as well as uh, across the university in terms of that 50 cups of tea. I think that's what we probably should title this episode. <laughs> I have to give my, my, call it my now colleague, John Childs, credit for that 50 cups of coffee. All right, John, thank you. That was fabulous. I love it. So admissions, let's let's flip to there. So thank you for providing that that um, clear and really robust understanding of the program itself. Admissions is kind of murky for any graduate student. I don't know if you remember I, when I went through it, it was sort of the uh, the papal decision-making process. You're, you're like, who's making the decision? What happens? You know, the puff of white smoke comes out or black smoke and <laughs> you're in, you're not in. So maybe you could demystify what this all looks like from the MBA, DBA program's perspective and specifically how you might prepare students for that admissions process. Um, in previous interviews I've done with department chairs or faculty members, they've positioned it as, what are the top five things uh, our prospective students can do to create a great application? So something along those lines. I'm going to take us to the DBA program and talk about a student that I had the privilege of interviewing who then subsequently decided um, to um, join our Saybrook family, and we decided that she would be an incredible uh, addition to the DBA program. This shouldn't surprise you, Nathan. We ask that um, our potential students come to the admissions process with curiosity in mind, with a commitment to discernment, um, and an ability to ask what we call powerful questions. So those are the kind of 
non-linear requirements that we encourage students to come to. We spend a lot of time in building relationships with the admissions counselor because they're the front face. They're often the first contact that a potential student has. And so I feel very fortunate, um, you know, I'm thinking about the admissions counselor who was responsible for saying, you know, of all the array of programs, it seems to me like where you're headed is the DBA. So that keeping our team alive and aware of what the programs are and who will best be served by them is just the first key. And so I feel very fortunate that we have an amazingly savvy team. Um, and, a, and more than just savvy, Nathan, um, their, their business acumen for any program uh, is really sound. Mm. So I, I just want to put that um, kind of check mark there. The second thing is that there is this flexibility. It's not a rigid process. So in, in the case of this particular student, she had already been accepted in another DBA program, was due to start, I think, in two weeks or something like that. And the admission counselor was able to say, you need to talk to Dr. Chess immediately. This is a pause for you. This is a moment for discernment. Um, and so um, in my conversation with her, I really spent some time saying, tell me about your purpose. What, what's driving you to this decision? And what we're finding, by the way, in the DBA program, and this is fascinating to me, and I, I know our, our numbers are not large enough to draw a conclusion, but here's some insights that are coming. The DBA is drawing back older individuals, so seasoned executives, who are saying, I'm going to take a pause in what I have been doing because I see some needs out there that need to be addressed. So this is for me. I'm coming to develop myself and my skills even more rigorously because I still have time for a third act and I'm going to make a real difference. That's wonderful. So it is amazing. So in that conversation of what's your purpose, what's driving you, she was able to come to the decision that while her other op option was absolutely perfect, this was what was the Saybrook DBA was what was drawing her and compelling her to align purpose with action. Um, and three and a half or so years of her life. And by the way, she's pretty tenacious. So <laughs> two courses this summer, Nathan, unbelievable. Um, but uh, that's kind of the process. So, and, and then there's the logistics. Got to have that application in, got to have that transcript in, got to have all of those requirements, but it's more, it's encompassed in this conversation back and forth about purpose and alignment with purpose. That's great. I like how you framed the, because you, you hit my next question, which is the interview, and it's not really you asking questions. It's a generative, iterative process, and one where the student is encouraged to frame the questions, the ideas, the and really engage in dialogue with you and the faculty. That's that's fabulous. We're probably, and I will tell potential candidates this, if you're coming here to be force-fed, um, we can certainly do that, but that's not the value of the program. Yeah, right. Um, our program is really around those conversations and around application and around experimentation. That's right. Yeah, it's not going to be your, your typical program where you come in, you take a test, you're done. Yeah. What's the future of the MBA and DBA programs at Saybrook? How do you see us, you, our students serving businesses from the big corporations to the individual entrepreneur? This is where I get to discipline myself, Nathan. <laughs> I have probably a hundred ideas for what that means, but let me start with our key stakeholders. So I think that for both the MBA and the DBA, we need to continue to be in conversation, and, and you've brought some of those opportunities forward to us, um, Nathan. We need to be in conversation with our key stakeholders, those companies, those executives, those department heads who will actually hire our MBA and DBA students. What is it that they're looking for? What is it that they need? And those conversations, we really need to be out there for. Um, I, I just want to give one example that actually you teed up. Um, we have a cross-discipline team of faculty who are just having a blast developing content um, for one of our healthcare networks. Um, and 
it is just a, an opportunity to find out what's needed, but also to work together to deliver what um, may or may not have been already thought of. So those conversations with potential um, hiring partners and colleagues in business are essential. I think the, the other thing that we need to, um, that's in front of us is an opportunity, and I, I give Dr. Radcliffe total credit for this, another one of our amazing core faculty, her ability to connect alums with those um, students brings two features to mind. It brings together hope and mentoring and support, but also it brings possible jobs, possible ways of volunteering, possible kind of, um, uh, I'm going to do a presentation, but you're going to be right behind me observing and stepping in. So that shadowing is just really something that Dr. Radcliffe also brings to the table. So um, uh, I think that our alums, our, our business partners, um, and then I think of what, um, what is coming from our marketing partner, Carmen, is just amazing uh, because she's giving us these venues to be in with the chambers um, and to hear firsthand and to contribute what we are all struggling with, what are the answers? Mm -hmm. um, that's probably our common ground. What are the answers? What are the questions? What are the questions and what are the answers? Yeah, yeah, that's that's fabulous. All right. Well, what a what a rich, rich discussion today, but I can't let you go just yet. So for every interview that I do, I have just three closing questions. They're rapid fire, so it can't be a whole lot of... It's got to be boom, boom, boom. And you're really good at this anyway. You're very concise. So first of all, what does the term humanistic mean to you in a nutshell? It means that I see you, Nathan. I see you because I listen to you, because what you say matters to me. And I will be unchanged from our conversation. I will be changed from our conversation. We're going to bottle that up and sell that. <laughs> now... The next question is, how does that show up in the MBA and DBA programs? You've been talking about that today. So how does that show up in a nutshell? That means that in every class, you're looking to your right, you're looking to your left, and you're saying, what can I learn from this person? What can I give them? What can I help them to see or to hear or to experience that makes us all as a community rise up? Again, an A-plus answer. So... The last connected question to this, how does it show up in your own professional, personal practice? Maybe an example. I just had the privilege today of sitting in, in a dissertation uh, prep for defense. And I left that meeting, you know, you think that you have studied and you think that you know and you think that you understand. And in these meetings, you get to you get to slip into the shoes of the student that has now become the expert. Mm -hmm. And um, I felt a sense of reverence. Um, that word just came to me, a sense of reverence for being in the presence of this gentleman who's taken the journey, um, the DBA journey. He'll be our first grad. Um, and um, I, I learned I won't be the same. I'm not the same person that I was uh, at 10 and 11 o'clock this morning. Wow, that's a testimonial right there. And that was so authentic. I really appreciate that. We should leave it right there, but I have one final question because that was okay. beautiful. And kudos to that gentleman uh, for for what has been life-changing for you. What a, what a powerful thing. So with all that's out there regarding the challenges to businesses and organizations, to people as individuals, what are three, just three, simple things people can do right now that'll have an impact, a positive impact on their business, their organization, or their own personal health and well-being. Just three things that you think would be meaningful. Get up right now, this moment after this conversation ends, and go out into nature. Take a walk, be in your backyard, greet a neighbor, but go outside. That's number one. All right. Um, number two is what new person can you meet this week that you have never had a chance to connect with and do so? And the third is 
what controversial, uh, what what um, book or article has a, a very different tone than what you're used to hearing or reading or thinking about and read it in, in its entirety with honoring the perspective of that person. Wow, very good. Get outside, go take a walk, right? Yes. Second one? Second one, uh, meet someone that you... Um, meet someone new? Yep, just go meet them. And third is a new perspective, read it and honor the person who wrote it or said it. And uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Open your mind, open your heart, try something new. Yeah, and move that energy. There you go. Been fr in front of the camera too long. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I appreciate you, Mary Kay. Thank you so much for today. Really, really energizing interview. Thank you, Dr. Long. Well, that was a phenomenal conversation with Dr. Chess. Holy Toledo. I think there were like 15, 20 gems that we could take out of that conversation. I hope you enjoyed Mary Kay as much as I did. If you want to see video elements, we've also created these segments that you can see online. We'll be posting those as we go. Um, you know, before we leave today, if you'd like to support the podcast, I'd, I really encourage you to go to Apple iTunes and leave a five-star rating and review and subscribe so you can get episodes as they come out. If you're on Spotify, uh, leave that five-star rating and make sure to follow us. You can, of course, subscribe to us on most major podcast platforms, including Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Pandora, and one of my personal favorites, Pocket Cast. But there are plenty others where we can be found. So for more about our MBA and DBA programs, as Dr. Chess discussed today, go to www.saybrook.edu. Click on Areas of Study at the top of the page and locate the program to learn more. Or simply Google Saybrook University MBA program. Thanks very much. Have a great one.